Hello all, this is Eric Rivenus, and welcome to another episode of Most Notorious. So before we get to the interview today, a gigantic thank you for everyone out there who has left a, a rating or a review on iTunes. I'm, I'm close to 900 now, which is just amazing and itching to break that 1,000 rating mark. So if anyone out there that enjoys the show hasn't left a rating yet, please, if you have a quick minute, throw a handful of stars my way. It's a great, great motivation for me to continue rolling along with new episodes and uh, bringing you hopefully a wide array of interesting true crime history topics in the future. Uh, Thanks again, and on to the show. My guest today is a lawyer and emeritus professor of law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, William L. Tabak. He is the author of The Insanity Defense and the Mad Murderess of Shaker Heights, Examining the Trial of Marianne Colby. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So is this a case that is one remembered by Ohioans? It was a really sensational one in its day. But but is it still talked a lot about in Ohio? Well, it seems to be uh, pretty popular. People do remember it. And uh, it, the, it posed the mystery, you know, of why this, this woman would do that. And it was very sensational at the time because you know, how often do uh, neighbors who seem to be very stable uh, murder a next-door neighbor child? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it is something that uh, is, is on the minds or has been on the minds of, Ohio, of Ohioans. What drew you to the case initially? Uh, what made you want to write a book about it? Well, I I was um, talking to one of the defense witnesses. He is a psychoanalyst. And I was teaching a course in uh, criminal responsibility. And he was uh, a prominent witness in the case. And he remarked that the lawyer who was defending her handled the psychiatric testimony very well. And, of course, that was to her benefit because the court found in her favor, the first court found in her favor. Uh, if, if finding insanity is finding in someone's favor, which it was because she avoided the death penalty. Anyway, when he made that remark, I wondered, well, how could, you know, testimony <clears throat> in an insanity case work in someone's favor when really the only person who knows whether they've committed right or wrong or were unable to control it themselves is the person themselves, not the psychiatrist. And you could have psychiatrists talking and talking and talking. And there were lots of psychiatrists talking. And of course, they had con- conflicting views. But uh, Marion Colby was the only one who knew, you know, whether she was responsible or not. But of course, she didn't testify because uh, she had a right not to testify and no one could put her on the stand. So that got me interested in, in in the idea. I wanted to see how psychiatrists could uh, persuade judges that someone was not responsible for their actions. What kind of community was Shaker Heights in 1965? Well, it was certainly one of the wealthiest uh, cities in the nation. And there were lots of, uh, I think it was uh, headquarters, the heads of uh, Fortune 500 companies, a lot of them made their homes there. And it was certainly very upscale. There were, uh, the public school system was probably as good as any private school system in the country. And it was a very calm place. Uh, Things like what happened with Marion Colby and her next door neighbor just didn't happen. Uh, very affluent community, and uh, the services were among provided to the residents were among the best in the country, and it was just a great place to live. So, what happened with Marion Colby and the next door neighbor certainly shattered a very tranquil existence that the people were used to. So, let's move to the Colby family, Marianne and Bob Colby, and their son. Dane. What kind of family were they? Did they fit well into this community? 
uh, they they fit pretty well into the community. The uh, father, Bob, was a uh, rocket scientist who worked for one of the large corporations in Cleveland. And Marion was a uh, stay-at-home mother and wife. And uh, as far as everything knew, things were calm in that household, except Dane was a kind of a troubled child. People thought he was retarded. Uh, but his parents insisted that he wasn't, that uh, he just appeared to be that way. But actually, they, they had no explanation for his condition other than that he was his reading was way ahead of his grade level. So even though people thought him slow, apparently in that aspect, his ability to read, he wasn't. He was he was ahead. Um, so because of Dane's condition and how he appeared to his friends, his, his friends picked on him, and he was the you know the butt of their aggression, and that upset Marion quite a bit. Bob was aloof, but didn't get involved in that kind of stuff. But Marion reacted very strongly to the other children picking on her son. So just a a short distance down from the Colbys was the Young family, John and Nancy Young and their children. Could you talk about them and their relationship with the Colbys? Yeah, uh, John Young was a, a chemical salesman. Uh, he came from a very prominent Shaker Heights family, as did Nancy. I mean, in in terms of social status, they were well above the Colbys. And they had um, three children. The uh, They had an elder daughter who was adopted. And uh, then they had a boy named Mackenzie. And they had a child, Creamer, who was Dane Colby's age. And he was the boy that, that Marion murdered. And the Youngs didn't really think that much of the Colbys, particularly of Dane. And there came a point where they didn't want um, Creamer to play with Dane. In fact, they suggested to Marion that, uh, that Creamer would look elsewhere for his friends. And... In fact, the, Nancy uh, kind of insulted Dane and Marion. She said that um, uh, Dane walks like a girl. He was pigeon-toed. And uh, that got Marion very upset. And based on that, that caused a, a chill in their relationship. They weren't social friends. And uh, Nancy made that pretty clear, that they did not socialize with uh, the Colbys. So despite the adults not having much to do with each other, the the connection that kept the two families in communication was their children, who played together. That's right, they did. Uh, They did, and uh, uh, Dane and uh, Greener seemed to get along pretty well. Uh, it was just the parents, uh, Dane's uh, or Creamer's parents, who had the problem. Marion liked Creamer. In fact, she believed that Creamer was more comfortable in her home. Kind of ironic, isn't it? In her home than in the uh, than his home. In fact, uh, he he expressed some fear to her of his father, who was a strong disciplinarian. Uh, the fear was that he was afraid to tell his father that he didn't believe in Santa Claus for fear of what his father's reaction would be. You had the benefit of interviewing people who remembered these events and have firsthand accounts, including some of the children who lived through the drama, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, they spoke with emotion, which I found very interesting. And uh, I it, I found it very uh, uh, vital in, in dealing with them to to get their memories about their encounters with the Colby family. And their focus primarily was, I mean, they liked Dane. They thought, you know, for the most part, they liked Dane. They felt they realized that Dane was troubled in some way uh, and that he acted out sometimes. 
But uh, the problems they seemed to have was with Marion, that Marion they found to be explosive and sometimes vicious. I mean, on one occasion, Marion actually slapped a neighbor child. And she also stuck a uh, broom in the bicycle wheel of that neighbor child, which caused her to fall to the ground. I mean, that's pretty rough stuff. Uh, and the neighbor child was John Young and Nancy Young's daughter. So that, I'm sure, uh, aggravated some of the tension that existed between them. You explain in the book Marianne Colby's own circumstances growing up. I'd love it if you could summarize this a little bit, uh, her background, and talk about whether you think her early environment had anything to do with her later actions as an adult. Well, okay. She um, she was born in the Dayton, Ohio area, actually in Dayton. And uh, she um, was a loner. She had one friend who was identified by the newspaper people after all this happened, who spoke to the press. And they, this friend described her as very reclusive, but very smart and an excellent student who liked classical music, not, not the popular stuff that most of the kids like. And that uh, she never took care of herself, that uh, basically she did not brighten up for school, that she looked kind of drab. And uh other than that she was a good student she just didn't hang out with anyone and the teacher one of the teachers remembered her that way yeah, but one of the poignant remarks that one of her friends made or that the friend made was that uh, when she met her husband to be and this was the only boyfriend she ever had bob colby that she started using makeup and that she brightened up at that point so, let's go to the morning of August 24th, 1965. Walk us through, if you would, the events that led up to the murder of Kramer Young, Jr. The, um, the Youngs were having breakfast, and uh, the, the, uh, they received... Marion called the house and, and spoke to John and told John that um, Creamer's jacket was at the house. And uh, she wondered if Creamer could come over and pick it up. So John communicated that to Creamer, and Creamer went to the house. This was about 8 in the morning. And when Creamer got there, Dane was there. And Marion was there. Bob was gone off to work. And Marion got a gun from her bureau, bureau drawer. She had bought the gun some time ago. And she took the gun out, and she shot Creamer in the back of the head. And she wrapped him up in some blankets, put him in her car, and masked the windows of her car, and backed out of the driveway. As she was doing so, a neighbor who was waiting for his ride downtown to downtown Cleveland saw the car back out of the driveway and noted the time. Marion drove over to Gates Mills, Ohio, which is an upscale suburb around Cleveland. And she drove off the road there. There was a field and carried Kramer. I guess he weighed about 50 pounds or so, but she was able to maneuver him to a uh, isolated spot in the field. And she lay him down there with the cover over him. And she, she had the gun with her. And she took the gun and pointed it at the ground and discharged the remaining bullets in the chamber. And from there, she got back in the car, drove back to Shaker Heights, picked her mother up, and they went shopping at Heinen's, which is one of the supermarkets in Shaker. And then she dropped her mother off. Her mother worked at a nursing home and went home. Now, meanwhile, John Young is waiting for Creamer to come home. And, of course, Creamer doesn't come home. 
what was her son Dane doing um, during this these minutes where she murdered Kramer? I mean, Kramer and Dane had been playing together, right? Was was Dane still in the house? As far as we know, yeah. I mean, there's no indication that he was not in the house. And uh, he was probably right there when she shot. We just don't know that. I mean, that never came out. But uh, as far as we, as far as we know, the three of them were in the house. And this was Kramer's favorite jacket, right? Yeah, yeah. He and his dad had gone to a store in Cleveland to pick it out for a uh, birthday present. Yeah, it was his favorite jacket. And his father, I mean, I mentioned earlier, his father was pretty tough on him. His father was very upset that he couldn't produce the jacket. So I'm sure Kramer felt relieved when he learned that Marion had it. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, this is Olivia. And I'm Tashana. We're the hosts of Something's Not Right. We do a bunch of research and then we tell each other crazy stories. They're usually about true crime, but we're down to talk about anything strange or disturbing. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, and you don't mind a little salty language, check us out. For more info on Something's Not Right, visit notrightpodcast.net. And now back to the show. So when do the youngs start becoming concerned when their son doesn't return home? He, he was supposed to come back right away, right? And then they assumed he was just playing. Yeah, yeah. Just, th- just think. I mean, you know, here, here it's about 8.30. Marion was gone about 8.20 with Kramer's body. And here it's 8.30, and they live two doors away from each other. And uh, John felt, well, maybe, you know, Kramer went out to play with his friends. And then it's 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Imagine yourself as a father, you know, thinking about where your child is when you have no idea at that point. But, you know, assuming that, you know, he's okay because you don't know otherwise. And then around 2 o'clock, I mean, before that, uh, he a friend came over to look for Kramer. And John sent him out to look for him because the friend hadn't seen Kramer. So they looked all around, and then uh, they started calling friends' houses. And uh, nobody knew where Kramer was. In fact, they called Marion, and Marion uh, wasn't there, of course. She was out of doing her, uh, what she did. And so it went to the answering machine. So eventually, uh, after all this waiting, at, uh, while John was upstairs, you know, looking out the window and wondering what in the world was going on, there was a knock at the door, and two Shaker Heights police showed up. And uh, they told John that his son probably was at the morgue. And at that point, John accompanied them down, downtown to identify his son's body. So there were never any other suspects besides Marianne Colby, right? She was the last person to have seen Kramer, so police quickly set their sights on her. Were there ever any other suspects considered by investigators? No, this is Shaker Heights, you know, and people never, you know, thought that there could be anything, you know, like that. I mean, no one was suspected. So they had to do some kind of reverse deduction and conclude that Well, the last person to see Kramer alive, as far as they knew, was Marion Colby. So they worked backwards to eventually identify her as the chief suspect in the case. Well, the obvious question, (laughs) I'm sure many of my listeners are wondering right now, is, is what could the motive have been? Why would a woman shoot a boy, a neighbor boy, a boy that she seemed to like pretty well? Um, That's right. How long did it take for police to put together a motive? Well, pretty quick, I think, because um, when John Young accompanied the police to the morgue to identify his son, he right away blurted out that he he thought that Marion Colby did it. I mean, they had no no you know thoughts about that about Marion Colby, but he he was the one who first brought her up as a suspect. And 
So the motive idea was perhaps one of the most intriguing aspects of the case because the neighborhood children, in fact, they told me this. And in fact, uh, this seemed to be the prevailing view of the people who lived in the neighborhood that Marion was madly in love with John and that John had spurned her. And this was the reason that she murdered his son. In fact, this was not only his son, but this was John Creamer Young Jr., who bore his father's name. So when John blurted out that uh, I think Mary and Colby did it, I mean, that seemed to, you know, set the uh, the uh, thought that, well, this was the reason she did. Except that turned out not to be true. That she was madly in love, or at least as far as we know, that she was madly in love with John Young. What would make him think that she was? <laughs> you know, that, that's, that was really one of the more intriguing aspects of this investigation. Um, I think that um, uh, I, I, have no, I have no answer to that. Uh, and uh, the... And and whomever I talked to about that, the neighborhood children, really just assumed that that was true, that there was really no, uh, they had no basis to believe that. I mean, look, he he thought that she had some kind of, well, negative feelings, obviously, for him, and the neighborhood children thought that they were loving feelings for him. but. The, there was actually no basis, no factual basis, either way. It was all done on instinct or on, uh, what should I say, feelings, just feelings. So, Mr. K, the man, according to your book, that appeared to be the, the target of her obsession. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, it was the real estate agent who sold him the house next to the young. Uh, um, she had an obsessive uh, lust for him. I mean, she wanted him. She wanted to uh, have sex with him. But he uh, he spurned her. And she used to tease her husband about this guy and tell Bob how much of a man this Mr. K was as, com- as compared with him. And finally, Mr. K called Bob and said that his wife's been pestering him, so stop it. So Bob and Marion had a frank talk, and that was the end of her associating with Mr. K. But she used to follow him around. She stopped him. So she had this very strong feeling for this Mr. K. And for some reason, everyone thought it was John Young who was Mr. K, but, but it wasn't. So what do you personally think was the motive for Marianne Colby murdering Kramer Young? Well, you know, that's there's a, uh, a, a complexity uh, of, of uh, motivation here. I think that she was probably enraged. I mean, she was very, uh, very, uh, she was aggressive. She was volatile. And I think she was enraged at the uh, Youngs for the way they treated Dane. On the other hand, here's Kramer, whom everyone thought was the wonderful child. He was handsome, fair-haired, blue-eyed. And Dane was not an attractive child. In fact, in the media, he was represented as being retarded, where where, uh, Kramer was just made up to be a wonderful, perfect child. As a matter of fact, uh, Creamer was suffering from dyslexia and was held back because of his uh, problems with reading, but no one knew that. So uh, Creamer was not the, you know, the perfect child that the media made him out to be. But in the uh, comparison, Dane suffered badly. And of course, Marion, this is just another insult to Marion. You know, the Youngs insulted her as a mother, in effect, because her child did not fare that well. And then the media insulted Dane, and that was just another blow against Marion. And then here's Kramer. And here's her feelings about John Young. 
And she probably was just overwrought as a mother with a child like Dane, who was a special needs child, no doubt about that. So I think it probably overwhelmed her. And since she was a violent, she reacted violently on occasion. And this probably, you probably put the, you know, that kind of feeling in the, uh, in her acting out together. And she murdered Kramer Young Jr. So it doesn't take long for the police to show up at her door. They take her down to the station and give her the third degree. Uh, what information were they able to extract from her during their interrogation of her? Um, at, at first, um, she denies everything. I mean, they really focused on her. And then uh, she, in an extraordinary confession, she says that her son murdered Kramer. And uh, he, it, 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 it was uh, one of the most startling revelations in the whole episode. She blamed her son. However, the police, uh, as they do, investigated to determine whether that was possible. And they took the gun and they subjected it to a trigger pull test, which shows the amount of force which is necessary to discharge the weapon. And it turned out that it required 15 pounds of pull to fire the bullet. And because of Dane's physical makeup, it was would not have been possible for him to do that. So she, they confronted her with that. And she broke down and she said that uh, she did. She killed Kramer, but it was an accident. And uh, so they had that confession from her. And from there, they thought that they could build a capital murder case. What was her explanation for that <laughs> she said yeah she said that the, she had the gun in, i mean the, the, some explanation she had the gun in her hand she was coming down the stairs and the gun was in some clothes that she had just laundered and, and wrapped folded and the gun was among them and uh it accidentally discharged which of course uh, is an incredible story um but there's more I mean, she not only was, uh, you know, held back in, uh, in confessing in this limited way after blaming her son, but uh, you have to look to the lengths that this woman went to hide her involvement in the crime. I mean, she blamed her son. She hid the gun in some hamburger meat in a freezer in her basement well away from any chance of being discovered. And in fact, when the cops went to look for it, they couldn't find it. And she had to give her specific, give them specific instructions about where that hamburger meat was and where the gun was. So she did quite a bit to conceal her involvement in the crime, even to the extent of blaming her, her child. And her husband, Bob, wasn't aware that she had a gun in the house. That's right, because he didn't want any guns in the house. He had had them at one point, but he wanted them all out of the house. And she never told him that she had purchased the gun. Ostensibly, she said uh, the gun was purchased to, to to kill Mr. K. I mean, this shows your thinking, uh, but she didn't use it for that purpose. And it was a, a crappy old gun, too, wasn't it? It was, it was yeah, it was junky, and uh, uh, she didn't pay that much for it, but uh, it it was enough to do the job. So this seems like a pretty open and shut case from the start for the police and prosecutors, right? From the beginning, it, it appears to be a slam dunk. Yeah, look at it. I mean, look what she did. She she murders the child. She hides the body. I mean, she carries the body off in her car that's concealed. She hides the body in a field. That was uh, accidentally, the, the body was only accidentally discovered by some some boy who was taking his dogs for a walk. And uh, then she hides the weapon and she blames her son. And then she finally admits to pulling the trigger. So this looks pretty compelling to a prosecutor. So it seems to me that 
The game changer is when the family hires their attorney, Jerry Gold, right? Well, he was, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. He was a very prominent criminal defense attorney. Uh, well, actually, he he was just getting into the prominence area because he had worked for the uh, public defender for a number of years, very successfully. And he had just joined a, a, a very uh, a, a f- a prominent law firm in Cleveland. He has some issues, doesn't he, with how she had been treated while in police custody. And he tries to take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. First of all, she's surrounded at the Shaker Heights police station by cops <clears throat> and by the coroner. And Sam Gerber was a very uh, imposing presence. And uh, she's by herself. And uh, people, you know, have a lot of, you know, derogatory things to say about lawyers. But, you know, when you need a lawyer, it's it's the best friend you can have. And there was and Jerry Gold was not around. And he insisted that he be admitted into the interrogation room and they refused. And when she made her initial confession about uh, first about uh, about uh, Dane having pulled the trigger and then about her having done it accidentally a gold had been barred from the uh from the room and could not uh, act as her counsel so that became an issue at the trial so there is a big deal made by the press about her appearance yeah could you talk a bit about what she looked like and and the perceptions about her based on this she i mean going back to how she was as a an adolescent in high school i mean where she really didn't take care of herself as an adult she spent a lot of time uh making herself up and she had a whole uh armory of of uh, of uh, makeup kits and, and you know, that kind of thing to enhance her appearance and the press always referred to her as attractive and she was she was a little plump, but uh, otherwise she was attractive, and uh, she had a uh, sense of humor to go with it. She was intelligent, attractive, and uh, appealing. And that was always uh, basically the way the press referred to her. So with Jerry Gold now starring for the defense, it, it still appears to be an uphill battle for him. She, she basically admitted she pulled the trigger and she seems to be a smart, sane, coherent woman. All all of this planning she did, buying the gun months in advance, I mean hiding the weapon, it it appeared premeditated the the murder, right? I mean, how does Jerry Gold take this and turn it into an insanity defense? It it, it seems a little uh, in, insane. <laughs> <laughs> it seems on the surface insane, interesting. Uh, it seems like a calculated cold-blooded murder. That's what it seems like. And the, uh, that's what the, the way the prosecution was going. So Gold tried to suppress her, con- her confessions, both of them, on the basis that uh, he wasn't allowed to counsel her at the time that she made them. And he was unsuccessful. So what's left? I mean, she has, she has no defense because everything seems to be so premeditated and thought out, which it, it was, obviously. So he has the insanity defense, which is so rare and so often, often unsuccessful. It's the last resort. So he's going to try it. And what he needs, he needs psychiatrists, psychologists, to testify to the insanity rule in Ohio, which was a two-pronged rule. If the accused knew the difference between right and wrong, <clears throat> then the accused was not insane and responsible for her act. Well, of course, she did know the difference between right and wrong. But that's pretty clear from the way she behaved. But if she, <clears throat> the other prong of the test is, if she did know the difference, but was unable to control herself, because of mental disease, then she is likewise not responsible under the state insanity rule. And that's what Gold was going with. So forgive my pronunciation of this, but but could you explain the 
McNaughton rules? McNaughton rules, yeah. And how Gold was able to use them to his advantage? Yeah, McNaughton, McNaughton was a, uh, a, a fellow in uh, London who tried to uh, murder a public official. Um, and he, he raised the insanity defense in the famous McNaughton case, as it's known, that he did not know the difference between right and wrong, and that also that he was unable to control his actions. Well, as a result of that case, the uh, English uh, legal system concluded that the insanity defense would be allowed for people who did not know right could not distinguish between right from wrong. But if they were unable to control themselves, that was not a defense that they could use. Now, Ohio adopted both of those tests, the right-wrong test and the inability to control oneself as an excuse for criminal responsibility. How did those rules apply to this case? Well, I mean, she wasn't, Gold wasn't going to get anywhere with the right and wrong part of the test because she obviously knew what she was doing was wrong. Uh, her behavior is, you know, really uh, shows that. So his argument was that she was so ill that she was unable to control herself. And to do that, he had to produce medical testimony. And he called psychiatrists and a psychologist. And the psychologist used the famous Rorschach test, the Inflock test, <clears throat> which <laughs> was reproduced to some extent in the Cleveland press. They showed a, a blot that Marion testified about. And it was interesting that on this particular blot, she said she saw two Scotties engaged in fierce a fierce fight with each other, a bloody fight which, you know, might say a little bit about, you know, her, her character. But anyway, um, they, had, they had the psychiatrist and then this psychologist who produced the inkblot results um, testify that she was not able to control her behavior, even though she might have known uh, right from wrong. And the prosecutor had to dispute that. And they put on their own psychiatrists and psychologists who reached the opposite conclusion, that she wasn't that ill, that so ill that she could not control her behavior. Now, during the trial, there were lots of psychiatric definitions or diagnoses thrown around. Paranoid schizophrenia, and, uh, uh, borderline personality, and passive aggressive, and all kinds of different psychological, psychiatric terms. And the judges ultimately, they were confused by the whole thing. And they ultimately concluded that, well, we believe that she did not know right from wrong, although that really wasn't what they were asked to decide. And they acquitted her on the ground of insanity on that basis. That was pretty controversial, right? People were not expecting that. And there was quite an uproar. There, there was, oh my gosh, there was an amazing uproar. And uh, going back to the business about John Young, about her, uh, her uh, fixation on John Young. I mean, there was, uh, you know, there was never ever any evidence brought out about that at the trial. And despite the belief of the whole neighborhood that uh, it was John Young, her love for John Young, and her rejection by him that caused the death of his son, um, there was not one word of evidence that suggested that at the trial. But let me let me add something, if I may. There were three judges. Uh, they couldn't trust uh, Gold. Couldn't trust a jury. He had a right to request a jury trial, <clears throat> but he couldn't trust one because the, as he as he told the press, uh, her neighbors all wanted her executed. 
And that's how a jury of lay people undoubtedly would have felt. So he went with the judges. When they reached their decision, they said their announcement in reaching it was, Marion Colby, we leave you to have it, which was kind of a uh, perplexing statement. And it infuriated John Young. And he blurted out, what do you mean we leave you to have it? But what they meant was that she was going to be confined to a mental institution until it was determined that she was sane to be sane enough to be released to the public. To the public. And now another quick word from a sponsor. And back to the show. Why do you think that Marianne Colby was not allowed to testify on her own behalf? What were Gold's concerns about that? Well, you know, that's interesting. I I interviewed Gold quite a bit, and we ne- we really never got into that. Usually, there's a, there's a prevailing philosophy that you you don't put the defendant on the stand because they're no match for the prosecutor, and they'll just get tripped up in uh, testifying. But uh, he thought that she was uh, she was mentally ill, seriously mentally ill. And I, I might add that her her neighbors never thought that. Uh, they thought that she was, you know, basically a little uh, shy, but, you know, nothing like that. And psychiatric in, in a uh, insanity case, you can use neighbors to testify that they're, that the defendant appeared to be sane. I mean, that's, that's admissible testimony. But um, I suspect that he just felt that the uh, psyche, you know, I really don't have an answer for that, Eric. I think that uh, if he felt that she was mentally ill, it would have been demonstrated beautifully had she testified. So I I don't have an answer for that. I think that uh, what he was hoping is that his evidence was so powerful that the state just couldn't meet it, even though the insanity defense is such a long shot. Um, so beyond that, I, I really can't, I can't speculate. Just the idea is that you don't put your defendant, criminal defendant on the stand if you can avoid it. It was obviously a good decision. <laughs> <laughs> obviously it was. And, uh, I think his, his, I must say in, in, in thinking about the testimony on both sides of the case, the prosecutor had a a good psychiatrist uh, is is probably as good as the defense had, but uh, I, for some reason the judges believe that uh, this woman was not responsible because of her mental illness. Yeah, that makes sense. If they were building her up as this severely mentally ill woman, and and then she gets on the stand and even has a, a semblance of sanity. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And she was intelligent. I mean, you know, that's something that's a given. And, you know, everyone knew that. Intelligent, had a sense of humor, you know. So it, those traits could have shown through, and that could have jeopardized her defense. Hmm. So, so how many years does she spend in the asylum? Oh, she, I, I, as I recollect, it's about three years <clears throat> she's there. How does she get out? She eventually files a legal proceeding, has a lawyer, not Jerry Gold, but someone else, file a legal uh, writ for her called a habeas corpus, which asks, why am I being detained? That's uh, It's a very basic writ in American law. And uh, she can't be detained if she's no longer a danger to herself or to the public. In other words, if her mental illness is diminished enough so that, you know, she, she should be free. So the psychiatrist at the hospital thought and testified that she was not mentally ill, period. In fact, they testified that they never thought she was mentally ill, even on the day that she arrived at the hospital. Yet she was kept there for three years. So the judge, this is an Allen County judge near Lima, where she was confined, released her. And uh, she went off to begin the rest of her life. That must have been just devastating to to the young family. 
Oh, my gosh. Yeah, because John Young is the kind of person he was. I mean, he energetic, overseeing, and, and, and very thorough. He followed the case all the way. In fact, um, uh, he used to uh, all, telephone the psychiatrists and Jerry Gold and to the point of annoying them. But, of course, this was his son, you know, and, you know, and that's how he felt. Anyway, uh, yeah, when she got out, it would make big news in uh, in Cleveland once again. Uh, she was in the forefront of the news. So Dane, Dane Colby, his mother tried to throw him under the bus, wanted him to take the blame for the murder. I mean, did he stick by her after she got out? Yeah. What happened was after she was jailed uh, to await trial, the uh, Bob Colby took Dane from Shaker Heights and they moved to another suburb. And Marion did not see Dane for several years. And Bob got custody of Dane, legal custody, got a divorce, and there were no visitation rights for her in the decree. And after she was released from Lima, uh, Dane contacted her. And they developed a very close relationship. He moved to the neighborhood where she was living. She remarried. Uh, she remarried in a what was called a common law marriage at the time, uh, not formal. There was no uh, minister or marriage certificate. They just lived together and held themselves out as husband and wife. And it's interesting that the new husband was an exterminator. Now that, of course, you know, you can have several thoughts about that. But um, in any event. Um, Dane spent a lot of time with Mary. <clears throat> they joined the uh, Mormon church. She was a Baptist by upbringing, but she uh, converted to the Church of the Latter-day Saints, became a Mormon, and Dane was very much involved with her in the church. So were you, as part of your research, able to interview Dane Colby? Do you know what current members of the Colby family think about your book? Have you gotten any feedback on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, daughter, the adopted daughter, who believed that her father, John, was uh, <clears throat> the object of Marion's affection, uh, asked me or sent me a letter hoping, asking me not to publish the book. And I talked to uh, uh, Kramer's brother, Mackenzie who was very helpful to me, but he didn't want the family to know that he was he was helping out, and who gave me some insights into the family and into uh, Kramer. But uh, there were, I think, a couple of other children involved or in the uh, young family as well, as I, as I remember it now, and they wanted no part of it. And as far as the, the Colby family goes, I, I would imagine Dane Colby probably wanted nothing to do with this either. Well, my very last, uh, my, the, the very last thing I did before wrapping it up, I took a trip to Hilliard, Ohio, where Dane is living now. He lives by himself. And I approached him. I Actually, I took a couple trips there because I couldn't find him. He doesn't have a telephone. He was in Indian when I arrived at his apartment. Finally, I did arrive. And, he opened the door, and I, I greeted him, and I asked him, I told him who I was. I had sent him a letter, told him who I was, and I wondered if he would talk to me about what happened. And he looked at me, and he shook his head, and he said, I just can't talk about that. And that was that was it. Oh, boy. <laughs> what, what a moment that must have been. One etched in your mind, I'm sure. Yeah, really, really. I mean, it is very memorable, very memorable. Poor kid. I mean, he had been through so much. And, uh, yeah, it was just, I don't know what I expected, but, you know, uh, whatever he said was fine. It, that was, I'm glad I was able to, to meet with him. Right, right. Um, so so what is the, the legal legacy left in Ohio from this case? 
this trial? Did it affect other cases that followed? Well, the legacy is that the defense that Marion used, the real defense that she was unable to control her, her conduct, and that excused her from capital murder was it's no longer an excuse in Ohio. The uh, legislature got rid of it. And now the Ohio insanity law <clears throat> is like the law of England, where if a person knows the difference between right and wrong, no matter what claim they make about not being able to control themselves, they are guilty. They are responsible for their conduct. I mean, as you point out, there was a, a huge hue and cry after she was acquitted on the grounds of insanity. Um, and it's always been a very unpopular defense. That's why Gold didn't want a jury, because he knew where it would go if he had a jury. And then eventually around the country, it's, the defense has been pretty much limited to the right and wrong test that England uses. So it's, uh, it's going to be even, it's going to be used even less than, than it was in the past. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you. So, so your book is available on Amazon Online, Barnes & Noble Online, and I'm sure other local bookstores carry it as well. Yes, that's correct. For people who want to learn more about this, is there anywhere people can go for more information? Besides, of course, your book, which we encourage everyone to buy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I don't, I mean, there's been, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, serious stuff written about the insanity defense. Uh, I don't know if there's real, if there's anything, you know, in the popular realm, too much in the popular realm about it. I just found it intriguing, you know, to uh, if someone is kill someone, you know, they are there are all kinds of claims they make about they're not responsible for it, this, that, and the other thing. But to say that they were too sick to kill, I mean, that's that, to me, is a very intriguing kind of claim. For sure. And she's such a, a fascinating character. I mean, what, what drives a, someone to kill someone like this? I mean, it's really a compelling, disturbing case. Well, let me, let me add, too, that when she ended up in the Columbus area after she was released from Lima, uh, she lived there a number of years with her new husband, and nobody suspected that uh, she had problems of that sort. I mean, she just fit in beautifully in the church, and she had friends, and people liked her. And they saw the sense of humor and the intelligence that everyone else saw back in Cleveland. They just didn't see the, uh, the antisocial behavior that she exhibited back then. So she got away with murder. She got away with murder. It appears to be the what happened, yeah. Yeah, I mean... You know, if, you, if you're smart enough and uh, and uh, crafty enough, you know, you, you can get away with murder. And that appears to be, that's my conclusion about what Marion Colby did. Well, thank you again for, for taking some time here to talk with me. Well, Eric, I hope it was helpful to you. Again, my guest has been William Tabak, author of the Insanity Defense and the Mad Murderess of Shaker Heights, examining the trial of Marianne Colby. Thanks again for joining me. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow. Hey, this is Olivia. And I'm Tashana. We're the hosts of Something's Not Right. We do a bunch of research and then we tell each other crazy stories. They're usually about true crime, but we're down to talk about anything strange or disturbing. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, and you don't mind a little salty language, check us out. For more info on Something's Not Right, visit notrightpodcast.net.